Good morning, church. I just feel like I need to pray as we begin because um, some of what I'm going to say, some of what we're going to talk about can probably easily be misconstrued, misheard, or uh, a little, little dangerous topic. So I just want to pray over it before, before we, we talk about it a little bit. So let's, let's pray. Holy God. Father, open our ears to hear what we need to hear and what is truth. Father, if, if there's anything that I say today that is not of you and that is not true, I pray that it, that it not be remembered, that it not soak into our hearts and into our minds. But Father, if there's anything here today that is said today that is truth, may it be heard and may it be lived. Uh, Father, Father, I pray that you empower me to speak your word. Uh, boldly. Through your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My parents met in college, both college educated. My father went on to become an optometrist. My mother a stay at home for our growing up years. We lived in a two-story home on two acres. We had a car for each person with a driver's license. There was no point in my lifetime that I can ever remember wondering if I was going to eat my next meal. We had everything we needed. We didn't live flashy, but we had everything we needed and more. Me and Heather met in college, both college educated. We, uh, we both have a car that runs we live in a two-story home on two acres, just like my parents before me. There's been no time in our married life where we have wondered, are we going to eat our next meal? And our kids never wonder that. We don't live extravagantly or flashy, but we have what we need and more. Grew up in the middle class, and here we are, we are in the middle class. My guess is, looking, looking towards my children, my guess is that they will follow that path economically as well. As their parents did, as their grandparents did, and even back into our great-grandparents. And maybe you've noticed similar trends in the life of your family, I don't know. Frequently what we see is what we imitate. The opportunities before us are the opportunities we lay before our children and they their children. What we experience is what we know. We know the language. We know the people. It is the path maybe of least resistance. And oftentimes we are a product of our environment. Most of us, I dare say, have a similar story as mine as far as imitating what you have known. It's no steadfast rule, of course, as many of you have forged your own way, maybe broken barriers that were set before you from generations past, but most of us have lived a life similarly economically to what we have seen and what we have known. Now this realization for me of these cycles that often continue from generation to generation, this realization for me uh, help me kind to kind of develop how I how I view people of, of all classes in some way and help shape in some way how I view the poor and I want to explain that you don't have to teach you don't have to set out to teach a poor person to be poor you don't have to set out as a parent to teach a rich person to be rich it's something we pick up on, right? It's, there's so many factors, but in, in general, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be taught. No course has to be taught. Every summer for 15 years, our youth and myself, we, we go to the inner city of Fort Worth uh, for the better part of a week. We spend time primarily with inner city children, um, loving on, teaching, on, teaching uh, inner city kids, but as a part of that experience, we are educated and get to experience what poverty looks like. And uh, you may not be aware, in Fort Worth alone, 
you can just about guarantee that at any, any given night this year, there may be about 2,000 homeless people who call Fort Worth their home. 2,000 homeless people in Fort Worth on most any given day or night. That's roughly the population of Paradise and Chico and Era combined into one. Homeless people are very transient people, very mobile people. So on any given year, you can, you can just about guarantee that in Fort Worth, Texas, some 5,000 different individuals will call uh, Fort Worth, their, their, the streets of Fort Worth, their home. And many of these friends, most of these friends, struggle with mental illness, according to the statistics and my experience. You see, I have seen how poverty is a very difficult thing for a generation to break out of. For these young kids at Fortress, it is what they know. It is what's been set before them. It is the standard, it is the bar that has been set. They know the language, they know the people. I ask you, who are the poor? Who are they? You don't have to be homeless to be poor, right? But trying to define the poor is about as difficult as trying to define the rich, right? It can, it can hardly be done. There's so many variables, so many factors. It all depends on circumstance. There's so many things going on. But let's be honest. We know poor when we see poor. Would you agree? We know poor when we see poor. Today, I want us to consider our response to the poor. But before we do that, before we do that, I want to, first of all, break through some of the misconceptions, maybe just a couple of them, and judgments that we might have about the poor. And the first one simply is this. Being poor economically doesn't translate to being poor spiritually or, or poor in, in faith. Actually, quite the opposite can oftentimes be true. I want to share with you from James chapter 2, verse 5. The context, James is, is discouraging Christians of favoritism. Don't, don't play favorites. And here's what he says. James, the brother of Jesus, he says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount starts like this. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. There's some kind of connection between the poor and a deep, strong faith. Now, Poverty is, of course, no guarantee of spirituality. In fact, poverty can make one bitter or it can make one better. Many, as you know, exploit, abuse, and neglect the poor. Just this past week, myself and Mia, our nine-year-old, have gathered around our kitchen table or on the uh, living room floor at different times, and we played the game Monopoly. We hadn't done that. I can't remember ever playing Monopoly with my children. It's just now starting. So on Tuesday, me and myself and Mia, we sat down Monopoly, and we sat down, and we play. And let me tell you, you know what? I'll just tell you what happened. I destroyed her. <laughs> I mean... I mean, I just, I just totally annihilated her. And I felt bad about it. I did. I even at times, and she could tell you, I cut her some breaks. I cut her some slack. Like I didn't demand everything I, I was, I was, I could have, but I just destroyed her. And she was actually playing a good game. She was making some good decisions along the way. It wasn't, it wasn't all her deal. Uh, I just, you know, I took everything that she had. That's how the game of Monopoly is played, right? It's like the poor, the poor lose and the rich win, and you take it all. Just yesterday, we sat down to a different game with a much different result. She, uh, she took my money, 
She took my property and she took my dignity all in one hour and a half. But many people exploit the poor. Many people do. Take away their pride, take away their influence, take away their voice. And you need to know this. Few things anger God quite like injustice to the poor. I'll make a short list of things that anger God, okay, as, 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 as I, as I kind of see it. This is easy here. Uh, sin, you can find a lot of evidence of sin angering God in Scripture. You can find a lot of evidence of idolatry angering God in Scripture, okay? But one of the top ones, no doubt, if you read Scripture, of things that anger God is injustice to the poor. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31 says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. Another version of that, NRSV, states it this way, those who oppress the poor insult their maker. Check this out, more Proverbs 31, 9. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Chapter 29 The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. The righteous care about justice for the poor. The righteous will see that they are represented, that their voice is heard and never taken from them. This morning, I want us to open up the word of God to answer the question, what do I do about the poor? How do I respond to the poor? How do I care for the poor? Okay, so there's three things, and these are on your sermon outline as well in your bulletin. But the first one is this, open eyes. Open eyes to the poor. Rick shared just a few weeks ago from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, where it says this, If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are hires still. Don't be surprised to see the poor and to see them oppressed. Jesus said this. He said, you will always have the poor among you. Guess what? There are a lot of poor people in every society. And sometimes our eyes are so closed to it, we don't even notice it. Sometimes our attention is so focused on me that I don't even see. And one of the first things we've got to do, step one, is we've got to open up our eyes and we've got to see. Did you realize last week as we left here, Sunday morning, last week, as we left here, many of you probably went out to eat, eat dinner at one of the local restaurants or lunch at one of the restaurants. And as we're leaving here, about 11.30, did y'all know some of our, some of our first friends showed up here at the doors and waited hours and hours in the heat because they needed something. There was a desperate need. Bless Kyle and Shelly and Leanne and Alan for staying out there all afternoon in the heat and serving, loving on, and listening to those friends of ours. Open our eyes, right? We've got to have eyes that are open. As we see, as we see them as Jesus sees them, we see all people as equals. Number two, open hands to the poor. Open hands to the poor. God set in motion a plan long ago for his people to take care of needs of the poor. Now, we're going to be rolling through a lot of scripture here for just a few moments, okay? So y'all bear with me. I'm going to put, it's all going to be up on the screen because we're going to roll through a little bit of a history here. But God has set in motion a plan long ago for his people to take care of needs of the poor. Let me give you some examples of that starting in um, Exodus chapter 23. God is giving his people Israel some commands, okay? He says this, concerning their land. He says this, but during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. 
Check out Leviticus 19.10. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner, for I am the Lord your God. God set in, plan, set in motion a plan for his people Israel to take care of the needs of the poor. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 7. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns, the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, verse 11, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you, be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Did you notice the language? The land, the, 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 the language is don't be tight-fisted. Don't hang on so tight. Loosen your grip and be open-handed with what you have to those who are in need. Proverbs 14, 31, as I shared earlier, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but it goes on to say this, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. When we're kind to the needy, it honors God. Fast forward to the New Testament. When John the Baptist test, was testing the genuineness of Jesus' ministry, Jesus sent him back with this evidence, and here's what it says. Jesus says, you tell John, here's what's going on. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the who? The poor. Who was Jesus proclaiming the good news to? The poor. Jesus' very mission statement, you might say, comes in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, where he kind of declares in one big statement as to why I'm here, this is why I exist, and here's what he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, this is Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. Jesus says, this is why I am here. There are those whom scripture points out, the New Testament points out as being very generous givers. Individuals such as Tabitha and Cornelius, both mentioned in Acts, who were called out for their great generous giving. It is no secret in the, early, or in the Old Testament and in the early church that one of the things the church was doing all across the land where they were taking up collections to care for people who had need, to care for the poor. You can read that in Acts and the letters. It is obvious that one of their basic needs or, or one of the basic needs that they were meeting was taking care of the needs of the poor. We are the new Israel, Right? We are the ones who do not go through the fields a second time, but who leave some for the poor. We are the ones who don't hold tightly, but who open our hands for those who need. We are the ones, among us are the Tabithas and the Corneliuses known for their giving. And we can join Jesus' ministry to the poor. We can join We should join, we must join in Jesus' ministry to the poor. In Galatians chapter two, Paul and Barnabas, <clears throat> of course, called to the Gentile Christians, go to the leaders of the Jewish Christians in this epic meeting and things could get very awkward very quickly. Things could go south very quickly, but it doesn't end up so bad. You've got these, you've got Paul and Barnabas, ministers to the Gentiles, and then the leaders of the Jewish church are meeting together and here's what, part of what Paul states about that meeting. Galatians 2 verses eight through 10, it's up on the screen. For God who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the to the circumcised was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James and John, those esteemed as pillars, 
gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. But I want you to catch this, okay? Listen, get this, verse 10. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do all along. Now, hold on just a minute. Gentile, leaders of the Gentile Christian Christians, those called to the Gentiles, leaders of the Jewish Christians, those called to the Jews, they come together and they say, you guys are all right. We're all on the same team. We're preaching the same gospel. And here's what the Jewish Christians say to, the, to Paul and Barnabas. They say, hey guys, we just want you to remember one thing. One thing. And it has everything to do with your worship style. No, wait, that's not what he says. He says, guys, we want you to remember one thing. And it has everything to do with the color of the, the carpet in the auditoriums. Right? No. He says, take care of the poor. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. We take care of the poor. Don't forget that. And Paul, and I love how he says it, he says, and that what they asked us to do, taking care of the poor, was the very thing I was so eager to do. I love that. We have a responsibility to respond to the needs of the poor financially, to see that they get justice, that things are fair for them, that their voice is heard. Open hands. And third, how do we respond to the poor? This one should go without saying, but, but it has to be said, open hearts to the poor. Open hearts to the poor. First Corinthians chapter 13, obviously the love chapter tells us all about love, but, but there's a motive that really matters in First Corinthians 13. Check out verse three where it says this. If I possess, if I, excuse me, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You can serve at Gear Up, which we're so blessed to have so many do that last week. You can serve at Gear Up. You can, you can go weekly to warm and give up your days and your time. You can, you can ring the bell every, every day of the holiday season if you want to. You can organize the food drive, and it can still mean absolutely nothing. 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 You can see that homeless family on the street. You can pull them into your vehicle, say, come with me. You can take them to your home. You can sit them at your table to eat with your family. You can, you can allow them to sleep in your own bed and it can still mean nothing without love. Our action is important, but it is our heart that really matters. It is one thing to care for the poor, but it is another entirely to care for the poor that we are caring for, to truly care for them. Well, the cure for the poor and the rich is the same. The hope for the, for the poor and the rich is the same. And it's in a name, it's in Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with being neither rich nor poor. We all need Jesus. But we as Christians are called, we're commanded to help and to continue the ministry of Jesus to the poor. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we are so grateful to call you God and to call you Father. And Father, You've called us not just to be your children, but to continue in your ministry. You've called us to lend a hand. 
You called us, Father, to open our eyes to those who hurt, to those who don't have. And so, Father, I pray this morning, Father, that we leave here with eyes open and hands that are open and willing and ready to serve. Father, some of us have a tendency to, to hold so tightly to what we have here. Father, I pray you work in our hearts that we can open up our hands and give. But Father, even in giving, Father, even in serving, I pray more than our actions that our heart, Father, will be moved, will be changed, will be softened, May our heart look more and more like the heart of you, God, and like the heart of your son, Jesus. Father, open up our hearts to love. Make us servants. Make us like you. Give us the heart of a servant. This our prayer through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Every Sunday morning, we, we open up this opportunity we call the invitation where we ask you to respond in any way you'd like to respond to, uh, to Jesus. Or if there's something on your heart, there's a prayer that needs to be shared, um, you can come to the full assembly and that will be shared. Or we also offer in room 102, an elder and his wife will be there uh, ready and willing to pray with you, to love on you, and to walk with you. What a great blessing it is to, to serve alongside this great group of people. But God has called us to do, to do so much in reaching out to the needs of the poor. May our eyes be open. May our hands be open. And may our heart be open. If you want to respond in any way to the message of Jesus, if you'd like to be baptized today, we would rejoice in that with you today. Now's a great opportunity. Please stand as we sing together. Give me the heart of a servant, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love, then use me, O oh Lord so that the world can see you. Give me the heart of a servant, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love, then use me, O oh Lord.